Welcome to the Roundhouse. We're extremely grateful to our colleagues at the Roundhouse um, for uh, launching uh, the Liberal Democrats' uh, Cultural and Creative Industries Manifesto, The Power of Creativity. We're delighted that Vince Cable, uh, the Business Secretary, uh, Jane Bonham Carter, and Tim Clement Jones um, will be here, uh, are here to uh, both set out um, what is contained in the document and in their broader thinking, and after having done so, to answer questions. Um, for those of you who don't know, my name is John Cantoner. I'm Chief Executive of the Creative Industries Federation, uh, the national organisation, uh, the national membership organisation for the UK's arts, creative industries, and uh, cultural education. Uh, we were formed uh, late in uh, to, uh, late last year in November, um, and we have a series of events uh, in London and around the country, uh, very much representing the views um, of all the sectors of the three parts of what we call the triangle, the public arts, the commercial creative industries, um, and education and skills and training. Um, we are uh, a, uh, and we are, uh, will uh, continue to be a fiercely political and policy-based body, but we are also fiercely non-partisan. Uh, we were extremely delighted um, to have as our keynote speaker at our um, very large launch last November at the University of Arts London, George Osborne, uh, the Chancellor. Uh, a couple of months ago, we were equally delighted um, to host Ed Miliband, the Labour leader, when he set out his approach to arts and the creative industries um, at the Battersea Arts Centre. Um, and no, no, uh, no jokes about what befalls um, organisations that host a creative industries events, but we're very, um, uh, we're very close and, uh, to our colleagues at the Battersea Arts Centre in their, um, in their uh, current endeavours. And we are equally delighted today to um, host the Liberal Democrats and particularly um, Vince, who has been a uh, fearsome uh, stalwart and champion of the creative industries in the coalition government over um, the last five years. And I think uh, all of uh, uh, us and uh, all of you who have been uh, working with him and with colleagues um, will share that view. There's much uh, to chew over in this document, both what's in it, what may not be in it, and other questions as well. Uh, when we do come to Q&A, even though most of you are known to most of you and to most of our panel, if you could please uh, introduce yourself uh, as you ask your questions, um, that would uh, be great. And this is also being um, filmed. Um, we, uh, the hashtags, I presume everybody knows for uh, tweeting, um, it's uh, uh, LDCreate and also GE2015. Um, Vince, over to you. Well, thanks to John uh, and to the uh, Federation for launching this and giving me the opportunity to present this uh, excellent document. I'm not allowed, I think, to call it a manifesto. That has quasi-religious significance, the word manifesto. <laughs> this is a, um, a vision, it's a strategy. Um, I think it's fair to say that uh, my party is the only one that has gone to this degree of depth in, in setting out a, a future for the creative industries. I think one or two people to thank for having done it, uh, alongside me, Jane Bonham Carter, Tim Clement Jones, who I think helped put it together, and Tilly McAuliffe, who was in the audience, who produced, I think, the whole thing, and a variety of other people who, who contributed in different ways. Um, let me just sort of put the context. I mean, creative industries, even quite narrowly defined, are sort of massively important. I think we're talking about 5% of the economy, one in 20, probably less, um, in terms of jobs, again, very narrowly defined, and if you look out to the overlaps with the IT sector, much, a much bigger industry than that. And growing very, very rapidly, um, some estimates, growing at about three or four times the speed of the economy as a whole. So this is you know, a real growth area. Uh, outward looking, massive component of exports. I, one of my jobs has been as president of the Board of Trade, going around the world promoting British exports. And invariably, whenever I go to China, India, wherever, uh, creative industry is at the heart of the British offer uh, and a very successful part of it. Um, we're talking about a sector with great diversity. I mean, if you start with the alphabet, um, you know, advertising, animation, architecture, but, you know, much else, uh, fashion, music, design, games, um, you know, a, a whole panoply of activities. 
Uh, and if you take some of our key manufacturing industries, for example, you know, creative industries are woven into them in ways that are very difficult to separate out. There's a, there's a wonderful institution under the arches in Paddington, which is where Nissan uh, do their core design work. Uh, you know, creativity is woven into the car industry. And if you, even more than that, if you go to Gaydon, which is the headquarters of Jaguar Land Rover in the Midlands, you get the standard tour of the production line and, and meet the apprentices and all that. But then they take you into a secret chamber, which is where the real value added of Jaguar Land Rover is, and that's where the designers are. And it's that crossover that is actually economically crucial. Now, in terms of where we go from here, I think we're building on some pretty strong foundations that we've built up in this parliament. Um, we've got the Creative Industries Council, which I co-chair. And the point, the point about that, it isn't just a sort of talking shop, the industry. Um, the point about it is that it has the creative industries absolutely embedded at the heart of what we call the industrial strategy. So alongside the car industry and the aerospace industry and the pharmaceuticals industry, there are the creative industries. And it's recognised to be absolutely fundamental to our long-term picture of economic growth. And the elements in this um, vision document uh, are building on some of the things we've already started there. First of all, a recognition of the key importance of skills and the work of skill set. Um, some very, very good programs built around apprenticeships, the new national college which has been established. Uh, we have a recognition of the importance of finance for uh, small growing businesses in the creative industries because for the most part they don't have fixed property collateral which is a key to getting bank finance. So the use of equity based uh, tax incentives, uh, EIS, SEIS and the work of the business bank is specifically designed to address those, those problems. Um, uh, we have the, the export programmes uh, coming out of UKTI, uh, which are very much focused on creative industries. Uh, but some of the other key elements in the vision are recognising the absolutely central importance of the broadcasters, uh, support for the independence of the BBC and the licence system, uh, something that, that we've been very explicit about, that Channel 4 should not be privatised. Uh, we want to see um, a much more inclusive approach to curriculum development. I think one of our, the tensions within the coalition has been our endless arguments with Michael Gove about a very uh, centrally driven uh, prescriptive curriculum, which so far precludes uh, creative arts, which is just utterly foolish. I mean, you know, quite apart from people who value arts for their own in their own terms, it. It is massively inhibiting to these crossover disciplines. Uh, we, um, we value intellectual property. One of the most difficult areas, actually, that I've been engaged in over the last five years has been implementation of Hargreaves uh, and striking this balance all the time between recognising the new digital, like digital economy and how you legislate for intellectual property within it while recognising that IP is central to... Uh, film and music and other key creative uh, disciplines and I think we have strengthened copyright and we've got the proper funding for the crime unit uh, and we wanted this um, strategy to make sure that that's extended in the very long term. But I think the final point I would make is this, it's a fairly broad one, but it's making sure that um, the creative arts are sort of woven into our thinking about policy in general. And I'll just give you a little example that illustrates it. Yesterday, I uh, um, helped to organise an event in my constituency when Nick Clegg came to visit us. And it, uh, ostensibly, it had nothing to do with the arts at all. It was taking forward our uh, ideas about how we prioritise mental health. Uh, and I managed to get some money from the Treasury to um, bring um, uh, courses into adult education institutions focused on people who had mental health needs. But when we went there, the way they were, they were starting to use the money was by organising acting courses. People with very, very low esteem, who hadn't the confidence, who had breakdowns, but were actually using creative arts and performance 
as a way of getting them back into mainstream citizenship. And so, you know, the arts are absolutely fundamental to what we do and the way we live. And, um, of course, the word industries is attached to it. There's money in all this, and that's crucial. But it has a wider and deeper significance that I think we should should be valuing. But thank you, and I think, Jane, you're going to add to what I'm saying. Well, no, just to um, endorse what um, Vince has obviously said, and indeed Steve Jobs, I happen to have this um, <laughs> quote to hand. Uh, it said about design, um, that design is fundamental, the fundamental soul of man-made creation. So that you know, fits in very much with our um, belief in, in the science-arts crossover. Um, can I also say that I think that... Um, a culture, creativity is central to a, a general, general well-being of the country, and, and that picking up on again on Vince's point about about mental health. And actually, it's amazing how many successful actors um, do tell you that that they were uh, shy, they you know were bullied at school, um, that acting was a way of of of, um, of finding some kind of self self-esteem. Um, I think it also uh, helps us understand. Um, uh, and appreciate the diversity which is so important uh, to the UK and, and our different communities. And, and finally, um, I'm fortunate enough to be um, Prime Minister's Trade Envoy to Mexico and I have seen firsthand uh, the prestige and influence that our creativity and our, our broadcasters in um, uh, you know, the BBC, um, uh, I always say, <laughs> Poor ITV, they, uh, they all think Downton Abbey comes out of the BBC, but uh, there we go. But it's a very, uh, the, the soft power point is also very important. And I don't know if you all noticed that um, uh, Mr. Farage today suggested that the licence fee should be um, 48 50 I think, £48.50. Well, um, I think you've all got a very good reason, another very good reason, not to vote for him. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, Jane, I, I think you're absolutely uh, right. Uh, uh, the Downton Abbey uh, uh, halo effect, uh, alongside Sherlock and so on. I mean, uh, I've been in China with Vince when Vince has been banging the drum for uh, our creative industries um, over there. And uh, it, it's wondrous to behold the reputation of the British creative arts. Um, and it is, uh, uh, it is film, it is TV, it's music, it's all the other um, creative industries as well. Um, so it's clearly something that we uh, want to nurture. And as everybody probably knows, one of my um, favourite um, hobby horses is about uh, intellectual property. And no doubt we'll have some uh, 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 discussion about that uh, in due course. But also uh, for live performance. Uh, so it's, it's two sides of the same coin. We have to um, encourage creativity, both live and uh, it, uh, recorded, if you like, um, uh, because that is the way that we get this crossover of skills between the arts and uh, industry, um, which I think is so important. Thank you very much indeed. Now it's time for questions. We have two uh, colleagues. Um, Lizette and uh, Dina with uh, microphones. If you want, do you want to uh, take a seat? Yeah, those seats yeah. and we'll very well covers. If you could please um, say uh, who you are and which organisation you represent, that would be helpful. Who would like to go first? Thank you. Hi, I'm Andrea Stark. I'm the Chief Executive of High House Production Park in Surrey. It's a creative industries business park, and it will be the home for the first national college for creative and cultural industries. Um, We've talked a lot about the creative industries, uh, its, its, its acumen in terms of export, the larger aspects of the industry. For me, working on the ground, it's also about how we support tiny micro-businesses and in large, in large part freelancers. And up until now, many government programmes, and when we've talked about them in the context of industrial partnership, have been based on things like the, the, the bigger parts of the manufacturing industry, the railways, the nuclear industry. What can we do together to really nurture grassroots entrepreneurship, the individual freelancers, the two or three people working in the back bedrooms? That, to me, is going to be the long-term future of our creative industries. It's how we cultivate 
that entrepreneurship culture in every small town and community across the country, particularly those that need to diversify their skills base and their economic base. So what can we do with our local government partners and with our local enterprise partners and with our new European funding programme and our growth deals to recognise the fact that we are uniquely a freelancing community and a freelancer sector? Yes, I, I, I recognise that, and although when you think about the car industry and aerospace, the rest of them, you're thinking big business, actually one of the key elements in the way we approach those industries is to develop their supply chain, and their supply chain is very much into small and medium and then into the micro companies, so we're very conscious of that. I think if you look at it geographically, one of the really interesting things that's happening in the UK is that you're, you're now getting clusters around the country of companies which, I mean, I don't know whether you classify them as IT or creative or some mixture of the two, but if you go to Sunderland or Dundee, not just the big cities, um, Cardiff, um, Belfast, uh, you get these companies which are, you know, as you say, micro-based, often freelance, uh, growing rapidly. And I think the key thing is to recognise them as a cluster so they can feed off each other, uh, so that they can get uh, shared premises and could cut a lot of their own overheads. Um, and th this is what we've been trying to do through some of the local enterprise partnerships. Um, I think there's also a recognition in government that um, you know, the growth does start from the bottom in that way, and that probably does mean getting rid of some of the more cumbersome regulations. Or, I mean, we managed to get rid of some of the uh, audit requirements on micro companies and, and I'm sure there's a lot more to do. Jim? Yes, and, and through the Creative Industries Council, which I'm uh, sure you're aware of, um, and largely powered actually by, by Dyna and Skillset, there's a website uh, called Hive, which puts together, I'm right, aren't I, Dyna, um, businesses at you know, a very s small level um, to larger level, who are, who are needing help on, on who to employ, how to find people to work with, and so on. And I think that, that will be, I mean, it's very new, but um, I think that will be very helpful in, the, in this area. I think it's worth pointing out one particular item which is very relevant to the whole cluster um, issue, that, uh, and we, that's why we've included it in this uh, strategy, is about devolution um, to our cities. Uh, to give them more uh, responsibility in a sense of their own economic fate because as Vince says you know a lot of our cities are uh, developing uh, specialties you know Dundee and Gaines and Bath and Brighton and so on and so forth um, and the more responsibility we can get because at the moment uh, we can give them because at the moment uh, uh, I think 90 percent of the tax they collect uh, it, or, 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 or is spent by them is collected by central government um, so that is not really a very healthy situation um, uh, and, and we think that's very important. The other thing I would say is that trade bodies, if you like, uh, using the example of the British Fashion Council, which has a new gen scheme where they actually help uh, freelancers, young designers, uh, uh, get into uh, 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 business and become uh, more entrepreneurial, if you like, is a very powerful scheme. And I think various other trade, I think UK Music has something um, similar that they're developing. Uh, that's also, I think, a very powerful way of doing things. And just a final point in, in, in this, uh, not manifesto, um, we, have, we are going to require local authorities um, uh, to publish per head spend on, on culture and the arts. So that should also help. There needs to be separate little and then like Eddie Levitin from the Alliance for Intellectual Property. There's some really encouraging stuff in here, so we um, welcome many of the things in here. Um, on the intellectual property protection, um, there's uh, there are some things that you've covered off in here in terms of PICU and um, educating consumers. I just wondered if there's a bit more you could say on um, the role of online intermediaries and uh, you know in terms of both enforcement and um, what policies might be put in place to encourage them to be more responsible. Yeah. 
It, it, yes, but, I mean, uh, in a sense, there's a, a limit to the amount that one can say about that. But um, even though he uh, belongs to a different party, there were two reports uh, that I particularly thought we should build on. And I'd certainly, certainly mentioned the voluntary agreement from advertisers uh, uh, and credit card companies not to advertise on infringing sites, which we think would be uh, a very useful uh, way forward. And that, I think, is beginning to take shape. Uh, but the second is to uh, uh, get more uh, agreement from the intermediaries, as you say, the consolidators, the Googles of this world, um, in terms of the way that they uh, uh, operate as well. Um, uh, uh, and I think, you know, taken together, um, those could be uh, a very powerful way of deterring uh, pirate sites. Um, but, you know, we are, we're just really in the foothills there. Um, uh, but I do think that uh, those two reports actually show the way and show that there is some willingness um, amongst uh, consolidators, amongst uh, the Googles of this world and amongst advertisers to do the right thing, but we just have to push them very hard. Well, we did, as you know, reach the VCAP agreement with some of the big internet platforms. But the big, the big challenge next um, is going to be how we proceed with the digital single market in Europe, because you know we're not just uh, an island in digital terms. Um, and it's something I've, I've, I've initiated the process of trying to reach a digital single market, which is potentially enormously beneficial to the UK, because then we're ahead of the game. Uh, but it will mean that um, uh, you know the UK producers of creative property uh, are exposed to you know international markets across Europe, and their intellectual property will have to be protected. So there is quite a subtle balance that will have to be struck between you know protecting IP and opening up the digital market and making sure that the big um, IT platforms are properly regulated at European level. I think particularly the worry about the territorial aspects of copyright is something which is um, something which we're all very conscious of. Thank you. Uh, Dinah Kane from uh, Creative Skillset. Um, so firstly, I would really just like to recognise and thank you, Vince, for uh, everything you've done actually in relation to developing an industrial strategy for our economy. Um, I think that uh, commitment to looking at issues that are beyond party and beyond election and looking to build long-term economic safety for the country is really important. Secondly to that, obviously very, very delighted that you focused on the creative industries in the way that you have. Thirdly, to turn to skills, I've just come back from um, a fact-finding mission in Berlin with um, other sectors within the industrial strategy, auto, aero, life sciences and so on. Um, and whilst that was fascinating and whilst the apprenticeship piece is so important for our industries, a principle you laid down in this parliament was the co-investment with industries in, if you like, other parts of that talent pipeline, um, including critically people who are already within the industry, um, where that co-investment has been really important to incentivise individuals, employers, to work together to meet some of those priority skills issues. Biz is an unprotected department in terms of its budgets. Um, obviously, um, great such a focus in here on skills. Mention of apprenticeships, I just wondered whether you could talk about what I call the other bits. Well, first of all, thanks to you for the work you've done on skill development within the sector, which is fantastically important. Um, as far as my department is concerned, I've made it absolutely clear that I I would expect that any new government would treat adult skills as a protected area of spending and indeed we've said that in Parliament and made it absolutely clear that that's what we expect. Um, it will, you know, we will have to find a way of making sure that the private sector contributes to skill training as well as government. Um, we've looked at various models as you know uh, and one of the big challenges to my successor or whoever it happens to be. Uh, will be to make sure that works because at the moment only about eight percent of private companies are doing training uh, so there has to be some um, incentive structure that makes it possible for them to do it mm -hmm. yeah and slightly tangential to that um page 18 um we one of the things we picked up very strongly from talking to all of you and our round tables was the feeling that businesses should actually go to schools they should go get to people early, young people early about 
the benefits of getting the right qualifications for jobs in the creative industries, because they're out there, as we know. And not enough young people are coming through with the right qualifications, and it should start in a way slightly before you, Diana. Businesses should um, go into schools, give careers advice, encourage uh, young people, show them that they can have this, this wonderful career in, in this wonderful world if they, if they, if they take up certain um, subjects. I'm sorry, something that we, I should have mentioned in the first answer, that, of course, we've got to do quite a lot in the UK, but there will be gaps, and we've got to bring people in from overseas, and, you know, we, we, you know we're, we're in a global market here, and I think one of the specific areas that we argue in this report is that uh, we need to keep the visa regime flexible for performers, you know, as well as for key skills. You, know. you should all read an Anthony Hilton piece about, about um, Tech City, you know, the, this incredible, new, vibrant place, and it's, it's about a very sort of mixed, mixed uh, group of people. And you'll see also there's a specific proposal about a powerful single body uh, for skills in the sector. Which one? Um, um, Hello, Sean Glasgow, Aspenado Limited. We're a startup providing financial education to creatives, and I think there's a market for my services, and part of that has to do with the schooling that we have when we're a lot younger. So this focus on creativity is great. Um, when I'm going off to school, I say I'm le learning reading, writing, arithmetic, and maybe that's elocution and communications as well. And in a world of computers and all that type of thing, how do we make sure that it's not just a creative education, whatever, because that means different things to different people, but it's an integrated education where we're getting both the left brain skills and the right brain skills, which are actually the, the powerful combination. Yes, I mean, I think you're making in a rather good way a point we were trying to make earlier, which is about this sort of crossover of different approaches. I mean, one of the very I mean, I, I, it stuck in my memory as it was the earlier part of my period in office, going to the Royal College of Design, where they have uh, Hockney and Dyson, both alumni, both interacting with each other. Uh, and that's exactly the kind of fusion that we should be trying to achieve. Um, uh, you'll see also that we refer to an initiative. There was the whole controversy, if you remember, about EBAC. Um, uh, you I'm sure will remember extremely well. Um, but uh, hopefully we're getting through that period where there is now uh, a recognition uh, uh, that a much broader uh, uh, set of assessments is possible. And David Laws has been driving that through in the Department for Education uh, with what's called Progress 8. Um, uh, so I, I we're hoping that that is going to lead to a much more balanced view. Of course, you know, uh, 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 our main manifesto talks about promoting STEM and so on because uh, particularly there aren't enough women going into those subjects, but we do want to make sure that they we're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater uh, and that the assessment takes place across a range of subjects, both arts and science. And so indeed, we mentioned the fact that Ofsted um, should, no school should be allowed to uh, drop art, drama, um, and music can get a good offset report. But I think you may be referring to also the fact that um, uh, creative, creative people and artists need also to have a sort of an understanding of economics a bit. Um, and um, indeed, uh, I was talking to someone in the fashion business the other day who said, it's all, you know, if, if you're going to make dresses, you also need to be able to fill in, in accounts and, and uh, balance your books and so on. Um, and I think that is a, is a, a point a point well made, that the, the artist in the garret is not really a, a reality. Um, probably never has been. And of course, coding, as from, uh, was it last September, is now part of the school curriculum. Yeah. So that, again, is another bridge. I'm just wondering, um, if I can come in here, why you're not being more prescriptive and more robust on the STEM to STEAM agenda and the integration of arts into science, technology, engineering, and maths as core uh, skills. Well, I think, I think it's a fair criticism, and I think the stem to steam, it's, I like the phrase, I think we should perhaps do more on it. I think one of the reasons we're probably a bit um, shy about this is that we've got pressures in different directions. On, 
on the one hand, um, you know, people always say you've got to have more and more stuff in the curriculum from creativity to sex education and lots of other stuff. On the other hand, we're preaching and believe that, you know, you've got to trust teachers and you've got to have flexibility in schools and the more prescriptive you are from the centre, the, the, the worse the school environment gets. But I think the theme of not treating STEM narrowly in terms of rigid disciplines is, is absolutely right. I mean, one of the interesting little snippets that came out the last few days is that one of our key universities, I think at the UCL, uh, has noticed a big, big increase in the number of women doing engineering. Mm. Uh, and that's great, that's something we've been fighting for. And it was done as a result of relaxing the demand that they do physics and maths, uh, and that they have a wider A-level uh, choice. Um, can I say, John, yeah. that we, we are committed to um, completing the rollout sorry, my of new high-status GCSEs <coughs> in creative subjects. So we are committed to um, enhancing the status and the quality of those GCSEs, and I think we, you know, we, we do understand the stand to steam argument. Right, much more I could say, but it's better, better uh, not uh, just there, and, and then um, there's some other questions, lots of them. Um, hello, it's Andrew Smith from Pilot Studios. If I, can I start by saying a big, big thank you to Vince, Jane and Tim for the tremendous support you've given to Pilot on our expansion. Uh, construction started last week. And when completed, that's going to be another 3,000 jobs. And thank you very much. Uh, you referred to local authorities earlier and the role about creativity. Um, I think if we could bring in the LEPs as well. Um, I, when I last checked, rather disappointingly, there was only one LEP in the UK that had a main board representative from a creative company. I'm not suggesting we should have sectoral representation, but uh, again, the LEPs have got a role to play here as well. Oh, sorry, the, the, the local enterprise partnerships, there's about 36 in the UK. Yeah, but the pe benefits of people who are not sort of immersed in government acronyms. <laughs> this, is, uh, this, this is the um, our government's alternative to the regional development agencies, and uh, there are, I think, 39 of these around the country. Uh, and it acts as a... Uh, th these are, this is the development arm of the, the system. And it's based on partnership between business and local government, essentially, and they vary in quality. Uh, but some of them are superb, uh, some of them less so. But they have, in practice, tend to be dominated by the big companies in a particular city or region. And uh, there has been a relative shortage of people from the small business sector, um, and that's regrettable. But I think in the the deeper relationship we're now developing with some of the big cities, Manchester is a very good example. Um, we, we, we've now got these sort of business centres in, in the centre of Manchester, led by the city with business support, and, and the small, medium sized company sectors are much more actively involved than in some of the less developed labs. I, I think we should congratulate you actually. <coughs> on overcoming South Bucks District Council funding. <laughs> <laughs> Is that Yeah. Uh, okay. Mr. Nichols. No, that was a great victory, actually. And uh, we did fight in government to try to make sure. Yeah. But it took three years, and I'm sorry for the delay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, question here in the front row. Hello, Dan Brooke from Channel 4. Um, can I just start by thanking you um, as someone who's in the creative industries for the special emphasis and care that you put into your thoughts uh, and the exercise generally. That's much appreciated. Um, I, I suppose one of the issues that the, that the creative industries have is that us in the field, we're all disparate, quite disparate sectors and uh, therefore, we, uh, I think, greatly welcome the existence of the Creative Industries Federation in giving us a forum for us all to come together. Um, my question is, how can we, in industry, um, come together better to influence government across this broader range of government policy, and in particular around this issue of education, which I think in the long term is a, is a very, very important one. Well, in a way, I think you, you've answered your own question. I think when I look back on my years in government, the people who make the biggest impact tend inevitably to the people who are best organised. Right? So, you, you know, the engineering employers 
uh, or the Federation of Small Business are in my office every three months, and they know what they want, and they're very clear, and you, you know, you can accept it or not accept it. The creative industries haven't had that; they've been very fragmented. Um, you know, the creative industries. Uh, council has been a useful sounding board and we've had people like Ian Livingstone who I was not abroad at the moment who I appointed as ambassador but it needs something more structured than that uh, and so I think the um, you know the way you're now organized through the Federation is a very you know, if you keep that and you insist on going to see secretaries of state every three months to press your case I think that's the best way you can organize yourself Thank can you. Just Rest you. assured, we will. Yeah. <laughs> on, the, on the National Creative Industries Council, I feel strongly, this is um, not in this, in this document, but that um, the Secretary of State for Education should also be um, part of that, uh, that body. At the moment, we have a Secretary of State for Biz and DCMS, but I think what's missing is, is education, and I think that would, um, would help address uh, that issue. Now, I would just comment that um, over the last few years, I have noticed that the industries, if you like, combined um, their power uh, in terms of lobbying has increased markedly. I went to a, a BSAC meeting where Robert Madeline uh, was speaking, uh, sort of sent shivers down my spine, but um, nevertheless, uh, it was an extremely good demonstration of, the, if you like, the asking power of the industry uh, to get some senior uh, EU official to come along and, and talk <coughs> and respond to questions and so on and so forth. So uh, I wouldn't underestimate the power of the industries now. And just to, to add to that, the, the increased pulling power, as, as, as many most of you in this room know that, that we hope to bring to bear, is by harnessing the views of the creative industries and the arts and education, who come to it from different perspectives, but whose whose uh, uh, collective voice is is stronger together than, than apart. Um, next question, also in the front, and then the lady there in the third row. Good morning, uh, I'm Sherk. I'm an art consultant based in Cardiff, and I'm also chair of RSA Cymru. Um, it's delighted to hear to delighting to hear that the arts and, and education features are high in this this book. Um, both are, are subject to devolved powers, uh, and while the work commission here kind of published its worrying report about, about education and art, uh, the Welsh government published its uh, creative learning action plan supported by two ministers, uh, education and uh, the creative culture with a two, 20 million pledge over five years behind it. So I think there is now divergent um, um, practice diversion in activities within the devolved nations. And I think it would be very good to, to see how that, you know, that can be a good learning process and how we can borrow across the borders from, from good practice. No, I, I, th I think, you know, my impression is, you know, whatever, I don't want to get into the politics of Scottish nationalism, Welsh nationalism, but I mean, actually, the devolved authorities have often been very creative. I'll take one case outside of the controversies in the British election. I just take Northern Ireland. Uh, was a, one of the best visits I ever did as Secretary of State were to um, the Titanic uh, area and the... Game of Thrones industry that's grown up in Northern Ireland, massive in the field and in Belfast, uh, and this is partly done with the you know energy of a devolved administration. And I think you know making sure that that you know hundred flowers bloom, uh, which is what we envisage happening through the city deals in England and the kind of parallel arrangement in Northern Ireland, Wales, and Scotland. I think actually, although devolved government is messy and it does produce inconsistencies and postcode lotteries and all those things. Actually, it's better to be devolved and centralised in this kind of area. And may I also just say that the Federation is a UK-wide body, and we're doing our roadshows around the country, Glasgow, uh, Edinburgh, Cardiff, and I spoke at the um, Arts Council of Wales uh, annual meeting. We've had good conversations with Creative Scotland, Scottish Government, etc. So obviously, the, the, the fact of, de of devolved decision-making is, is clear and, and laudable, but there's a huge amount of which can be gleaned by working together, um, city by city, region by region. Um, there was a lady there in the third row who yeah, wants to ask a question. Then... Okay. My name's Rachel Maggart. I'm a painter, and I work for a gallery called Stone Pissarro and 
selling modern and impressionist art. I had a question that's fairly straightforward. Um, I wonder about freeing up workspaces in central London and if you have any ideas for um, taking back neglected or vacant spaces and making them available for artists because um, they're really long waiting lists and it's, it's very expensive to get a decent space in central London. I don't have anything specific to say about artist spaces, and somebody else may be able to augment it, but, but what you've touched on is actually quite a raw nerve. Um, there is a big argument running, or has been an argument running through the coalition, um, which is about the liberalisation of planning rules, uh, where the Chancellor and um, Mr Pickles and various other people have been pushing quite aggressively uh, to um, free up uh, use of space, which is currently devoted to industrial, commercial, including galleries, uh, and allocate it to residential, if that's what people want. Uh, and of course, given the differential in uh, development value, of course, uh, developers are now rushing like a vast herd into the conversion of uh, industrial and commercial space into housing. Um, and I'm beginning to see all over London big scarcity emerging, you know, small firms being driven out because of commercial rents, uh, artists not able to secure any kind of premises, uh, it's affecting, uh, you know, Shoreditch is now very, very difficult to operate within, uh, and some of the other clusters have been squeezed out of existence. I've, I've actually been fighting this in government, um, and we've got to a position now where the policy is blocked. Um, and it, it's not extended beyond 2016, but I think one of the things which a new government will reopen is that issue, and it's got enormous implications for the availability of space. Um, I, I, I don't know if any of you were at the um, uh, Covent Garden hustings, but I mentioned the fact that my, my sister's an artist, and when she was starting out, um, which was rather a long time ago, but. I think it was BT had a, a warehouse that they weren't, a space they weren't using at that time. And they uh, rented it, Peppercorn Rent, to a cooperative of artists. And they took it back when they needed the space. But um, uh, I was talking to someone earlier today, not only did this provide space for artists, but they actually, um, going back to your question, they learned early on um, some sort of commercial skills, really, because they had to deal with, with the you know, running the space, the rent, etc., etc. And I, I think that's something that you know um, uh, companies should should look at. And just to say, we've been in early discussions with the mayor's office about this. The cultural department of the mayor's office are, are um, appraised of it, and if you wanted to talk to us about that afterwards, that we're starting um, work on that in terms of lobbying and that from a specific London, but it's not just a London. Problem that's beginning to happen in other but cities, central Birmingham, central <coughs> Birmingham, Manchester, okay. and elsewhere in, um, uh, in Glasgow too. Um, next question. Fifth row. Yeah. Hi, uh, I'm David Hutchison. I'm from the Stage uh, newspaper. Um, I think it's really good the conversation has turned to artists because uh, they are obviously an incredibly central part of the creative industries. Um, it's very well and good talking about the collaboration between um, you know, uh, science skills and art skills, but artists are obviously at the heart of several um, massive things, acting, writing, uh, directing, musicians. My question to you is this, um, what are you going to do to nurture, further nurture and diversify um, artists and talent um, in the UK? Well, the one thought I've had, which is again another hobby horse, is um, to do with intellectual property. Um, and it's how you um, uh, regulate the agreements between, if you like, the big players and the artists. And um, uh, one of the things I've been pressing for, um, and there is a review taking place at the moment, um, which is on this question of unfair contracts um, uh, between uh, artists and the major organization, where there is a clause, for instance, in a, in a contract saying you shall uh, give up all your rights in the intellectual property that you create, and so on and so forth. That is one uh, element of really rather an important 
um, way of trying to get the the right uh, amount of value to each player in that value chain uh, in the creative industries. That sounds a little bit jargony, but the fact is that there is, and there was a very good piece in the Times this morning about the need for greater transparency um, uh, in terms of who is getting what out of the creative process. Now, I think that's a very big subject which needs unpacking, but just the beginning of it is um, at least um, treating contracts in the creative industries which deal with copyright in the way that normal contracts are dealt with so that if um, uh, it's clear that this, the big player has undue influence, if you like, um, then there is a remedy for it. But there is a long way to go. I think before we got that right, there was a Westminster Media Forum uh, uh, gathering last week that focused quite heavily, actually, on this particular issue as well. And we had record labels there. We had, you know, a variety of players. And I think it's a general recognition, particularly in the digital world, uh, that we need to get this right. Can I say, I think there's a bit of a language problem here. Because I think this is all about recognising artists, actually. And we, you know, the term creative industries um, has been used extremely successfully. And I think this is not... Um, I mean, uh, Vince is a great appreciator of the arts anyway, but actually to get to the Treasury, to get to um, central government, um, to make them understand that artists aren't just sort of, you know, wasting, wasting, foodling around, having a lovely time, that they actually feed into our economy, um, is why I think it's important that they're called the creative industries. But this is the power of creativity. You know, this is the power of the artist, the, the, the filmmaker, the... Um, you know, uh, Vince was talking earlier um, um, about a factory he visited. I mean, uh, Leavesden, where Harry Potter was made, was once somewhere where Rolls Royce made heli helicopter engines. You know, and it's, it is now a hugely successful um, film. Uh, uh, well, it's not anymore, is it? It's actually the Harry Potter theme part, or whatever. But um, but all I mean is that. As you as you did, thank you. Uh, but um, this is all about about artists, really. Mm. Um, no, I, I, just a general thought. Um, I'm not sure whether the issue in relation to performing artists is a shortage of supply. I mean, I have three grown-up children, um, one of whom is a quantum physicist, another is a corporate lawyer, and the third is an opera singer. And, uh, <laughs> and my opera singing son had great difficulty making a living, not least because of the you know, massive supply of talent in the UK relative to demand. So it's not that we're short of talent. Uh, it's, it's actually so they, they can earn a living, and that's partly IP, but it's partly you know, creating a market for people who love opera. Uh, Nick. <coughs> Nick Toon from Time Warner, uh, owners of HBO. Um, first of all, just to say thank you very much, Vince, for your kind comments about the visit at Game of Thrones. I'm glad you uh, enjoyed it. It's really just an observation picking up on that and this point about devolution, which is in what we've seen there, certainly. Uh, de devolution of power and responsibility to local areas is crucially important, I think, in order for, to enable them to, to maximise their opportunities. But it does also then require a really good working partnership with central government. It's not just about saying, OK, there you go, you're responsible. And actually, one of the things that struck us in Northern Ireland is a really successful relationship between central government and, and the people on the ground, which helped deliver the, the uh, work, you know, successful policies through the Treasury and elsewhere. Uh, and obviously this is going to be a crucial issue, I think, in looking at the polls at the moment in terms of the outcome of the next election. So it's an observation, really, that whatever the outcome of the next election, central government and the devolved assemblies and local authorities are going to have to find a successful way of working together in partnership, uh, whatever the political map looks like, if we're really going to maximise the success of the industries going forward. Yes, no, I, I recognise that. I mean, I think in relation to the English um, as opposed to devolved authority, the English uh, deals that we have with some of the big cities. I think it's a very good balance between local decision making and central government, well, I would say conditionality. Uh, they're, they're negotiated and it's about right. But I don't think it's a stable arrangement because I think inevitably um, the appetite for local control is going to grow. I think that's right. We we're a totally over centralised country. And um, you know, with that will follow, as you've seen in Scotland, um, you know, self-government is a, an appetite that feeds on itself. So I, 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 I don't think, actually, central government is going to be able to control uh, local spending in the way that it did. And you are going to get a very uneven pattern of development as a result of that. I think on balance that's probably a good thing. I mean, if you look at um, 
uh, decentralized countries in Europe like Germany. Um, the, big, the big German cities and lender have developed their own cluster of, of arts and creative industries development in a positive way. So I don't fear that, but I, I don't think you can maintain the central government control in the way that we have in, the UK, in, in England. But uh, on the other hand, I do think that the power of government to promote, um, which Vince does, you know, abroad, which, for instance, the government did with the International Festival of Business in Liverpool, and even though someone like Joe Anderson doesn't exactly have the same um, views as, um, as the government, uh, the coalition, uh, uh, nevertheless, he was extremely enthusiastic about the partnership uh, for the International Festival of Business and so on, and that worked extremely well. Yeah, that's a good example. I think one uh, front row, and unless anybody uh, has any other burning questions, we'll leave that as the last question here. Oh, sorry, there's one at the back here, there as well. If it, they could both be quite quick, because we do need to wrap the uh, Zach Polanski. I work at Arts Educational in the National School of Circus Arts and various other arts organisations as a mental health therapist, so I'm naturally delighted this uh, document exists. Um, I'm really aware when I'm in those organisations and various organisations how white male middle class and heterosexual um, artists can be in, in training organisations. What can the Liberal Democrats do to promote opportunity for everyone? Well, that's a challenging question. I mean, we, we, you know, we're very committed to diversity in general. I'm not thinking of a separate set of diversity policies for uh, the arts, but um, you know, certainly the work I've been doing and my colleagues on making sure that we got proper uh, gender representation at the top of big business has been actually crucial and highly successful and we're wanting to widen that out now in terms of black and Asian representation on the boards of big companies. I think once, once the leading companies are, are properly diverse at the top end then of course you establish a pattern throughout the organisation and I'm sure that's true in the arts as well as ever was. Um, I couldn't agree more. Um, there is um, around, uh, the, the DCMS set up a, a round table, BAME round table, which is at the moment really rather um, dedicated to the broadcasters, I see Dan nodding his head, and the film industry. But as a consequence of this, um, all the broadcasters and the BFI have published manifestos which um, are committed to, to raising um, this, this issue. And I think this time, it is not going to be empty words because this has been going on for a long, long time. Uh, there are re there's real commitment. I see Dan nodding his head. Uh, there's real commitment because it is shocking. And actually, just look around this room. And, and you'll see it's a reference in here. Yes. Last question at the back. Neil North from Arkeeba. Um, I'd also join everyone in thanking you for the vision document. I think it's a very useful um, document. Um, on page 14, you talk about using a variety of measures to ensure there is a vibrant local and hyper-local media, including redirecting the current subsidies for local television. Of course, local television was sort of born in, during this parliament in some kind of political controversy. Um, Labour accused um, local television of being Jeremy Hunt's vanity project um, a couple of months ago at the Oxford Media Convention. Ed Vasey suggested that local television was a stunning success. I just wonder um, what the vision is for local television and, and when you're talking about redirecting subsidies, would this suggest that you wouldn't or you would oppose a further top slice of the um, television licence fee to prop up local television? Well, I think we certainly oppose the latter. We don't believe in, in a, top, a top slice. Um, I, my perception is that local television has not been a great success which is why I think we've suggested that the, the funds be, um, be diverted to, um, well, as, as you've just read, read out, to, to, to local, um, hyper-local media. Um, so I think we, we, we believe, believe in what we've written here. Yeah. <laughs> or agree with what we've written here. Well, that's a relief to know. Yeah. <laughs> um, right, it's, it's we time. We also, of course, have a commitment to plurality, as you will also see on that page. It's, it's time for us to end. If I could just emphasise, um, uh, thank uh, our audience members to emphasise that if any of you, whether you are an individual practising artist or a CEO of, um, uh, of a, uh, a large company or um, a representative of an arts organisation or many others besides 
Um, and to become members of the Federation, then you can feed into our policy work, you can nominate for the Advisory Council, um, and you'll be able to um, attend uh, in future our events are going to be um, uh, first dips for members. And there's a huge amount of work. Um, we're off to launch our first uh, UK roadshow, a very large event, um, next week in Manchester and many other um, activities besides all on our website. If you want to talk to any of our colleagues here, there are several of us here who can talk you through. But um, I'd like to, also, uh, to uh, once again thank the Roundhouse, Marcus Davy, unfortunately, who's one of the co-chairs of our advisory uh, council, is, up, is unable, he's uh, travelling abroad today um, to have been here, but has um, thanked the Liberal Democrats for um, choosing the Roundhouse um, to uh, be the venue for your, uh, um, the launch of your document. I'd like to thank all of you for coming. I'd like to thank Tim, Jane and Vince, um, both for your ongoing work and uh, for launching this and wishing you all the best um, for your campaign. Thank you very much.